Hello and welcome to the Car Kernel channel and welcome to the 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander. A brand new model from Toyota and in my opinion a very important one. This model, the best way to describe it is, it's back to basics Toyota. You'll see what I mean by that as we go through the review, which we're going to start with a technical review under the hood, talk about the powertrain and everything good and exciting. We're going to take a look underneath it, inside and outside, to discover if Toyota did well with this new model or not right after this. Let's start our technical review under the hood with the different powertrains. So the Grand Highlander has three options for powertrains. The first one is a non-hybrid trim. Now gone is the V6, same thing with the Highlander. The non-hybrid version will have the T24A FTS 2.4 liter turbo direct and port injected engine, which is basically the same as this one in the Hybrid Max, but some differences here and there. We will talk about everything in detail. This engine we will cover in this video. Now made it to the non-hybrid version is an eight-speed transmission, ASIN transmission, pretty s simple transmission. This transmission did have some issues back in 2017 when it first came out, but those are long gone. Kind of became the standard. Every single non-hybrid Toyota almost, other than CVTs, will have an eight-speed transmission by ASIN. A little bit about that transmission. The Oil pan is in the front. It is a little bit of a bad spot, but that's what they deemed it. And then the transmission itself does have a little bit of an odd shift pattern. That was one of the concerns about it, but otherwise there hasn't been issues with it other than the 2017, 18 years. Now, moving on to the hybrid variants, because we have actually two hybrid variants. There is a standard hybrid variant, which is exactly the same as a standard Highlander. You have an A25A FXS, which is a 2.5 liter non-turbo engine. We've talked many, many videos about this, this engine in detail, so I'll leave some of those videos up here in the screen and in the description if you're interested about those technical details. But that powertrain is made it to a ECVT transmission, a P810. Basically, that transmission is exactly the same as the ECVT in the Highlander Hybrid, the Sienna Hybrid, the RAV4 Prime. That is exactly the same transmission. And just one note, do not mistake that for a regular CVT. They're actually super reliable. They do have the drone that can be annoying, but it is a super reliable transmission. Don't be afraid of the ECVT because of the words CVT. Now, that works exactly like this conventional hybrid system from Toyota that has been basically the same operation principle since the inception of the hybrid system back in the early 2000s, late 1990s with the first generation Prius. It does drone, doesn't have a lot of power, but it is very efficient and it's very reliable. Now the third option, which is something Toyota's kind of the new hybrid system, which is this one, which we're going to focus on heavily in this video. This is the Hybrid Max system. So the engine is also a T24A FTS, 2.4 liter turbocharged. We'll talk about some of its mechanical details here. But made it to that is a tr unique transmission that is all new. It's called a PC60. Let us dive into this hybrid system and then we'll talk about more details. So starting with the engine, some of the mechanical aspects. This is a plastic valve cover. It's becoming, kind of becoming the norm in the automotive industry. Nothing really of a concern because Toyota has been using plastic valve covers for a while. Up till now, we haven't had issues. It seems pretty quality made and that's good. But something they did with this engine that is actually not good, in my opinion, as a mechanic. So this engine kind of derives from the A25A, which is a 2.5 liter version. They took that. I feel like they modified it to make this one. So on top of the valve cover, typically you'll find your ignition coils, your high pressure fuel pump, in the case of this one, this one does have direct injection, we'll talk about that in a little bit, which is not a big deal, two bolts, comes out and simple if you want to remove the valve cover. But in this engine, this particular, the T24A, they decided to move the direct injectors from the side of the cylinder head all the way on top. Now that adds a lot of complication for service, and in my opinion, the gain of positioning the direct injectors there not really huge. I wish Toyota would have went with the sensible route that they usually go with. They didn't. Because when you remove the valve cover, for as simple as a valve cover or gasket replacement, very simple, something happens with age, you have to remove the injectors. 
you have to replace all the seals on these very fragile injectors and some of them will get stuck and now you're if they break now you're buying a new injector and programming it just adds way too much complication for the gain of 0.0091 miles per gallon that's the problem that's the possibly the only problem with this engine that i see now moving on from that this has a two-piece cylinder head no gimmicks about the valve train. It's pretty standard valve train. It does have dual VVTi, not electronic like the A25. This just has regular oil controlled VVTi. And then roller rockers, hydraulic lifters, pretty standard. And inside this engine looks exactly like the A25A. And for that matter, most Toyota engines from the mid 2000s all the way till now, very standard valve train now we move into more of the mechanical aspects of this engine this has a two-piece front timing cover they did that to avoid very common leak with toyotas from the front timing cover where the cylinder head and the block meet the front cover so they made a very over elaborate system to kind of bypass that but i feel like they added a lot in that process so far we haven't had leaks and issues from these so that is good it's working so far but i feel like they added too much complication with the double timing cover now this engine does have two timing chains one of them from the cams to the crank and one of them for the oil pump very very simple speaking of the oil pump it is a variable oil pump so it can electronically control what is the pressure of that oil pump not just by how much it revs until the pressure relief valve lets go of the pressure now this engine cooling system is pretty interesting it does have a coolant management valve which sends the coolant where it needs to go but it has a mechanical water pump many people will like that i actually don't i think the electric ones are more efficient and if we were going to do something that is modern and efficient electric water pump would have been better computer can really control when it comes on what the rpm is now you're kind of tied with the engine but they went the old school route we won't fault them for that very simple water pump belt driven few bolts comes out very simple let's talk about the fuel system of this engine briefly this has d4s system from toyota proven reliable we've had a video where we tested it after some miles to see if it builds carbon i'll leave that video right here as well if you want to see it but this system works and the way it works is it has direct injection and port injection not at the same time but you have both so the risk of carbon buildup is not there because you do have these port injectors only downside of that like we talked about the injectors are on the valve cover which does add some complication to service now this engine is turbocharged and many folks have commented mentioned that we're concerned about these turbos and look folks the truth have to be said turbo engines are not as reliable as non-turbo engines however turbos have come a long way the truth also have to be said everything i look around this turbo things are well made and that is a good thing but maintenance is key for these engines and it is very important that you take care of the maintenance, specifically the oil changes on time. No 10,000 mile oil changes. Just kind of throwing that in there, especially with a turbo engine. Now this turbo kind of takes things, the good old school and the good new school. Let's talk about that. So the wastegate is the little door that controls the pressure of this turbo. In modern cars, we're seeing a lot of them, things like the Tundra, for example, and Sequoia with the V6. They have an electronically controlled wastegate. So basically you have a little actuator that opens and closes that wastegate. Now that actuator is electronic and it is in a very hot area and they can fail earlier than this one, the old school way. This has vacuum control and some people will laugh, but that's actually, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Vacuum controlled are very simple, kind of a little solenoid that sends vacuum or takes it off the wastegate control it very simple should anything go wrong very simple to service and life is good and the new school side this doesn't have an intercooler in the front like your cool old supra this has a liquid intercooler which is very efficient compact things where you don't have all the hoses and the pipes going everywhere that uses coolant to cool the charge and it goes in now this car has technically the hybrid max system has three cooling systems one of them for the engine one of them for the turbo intercooler one of them for the hybrid system but here they combine the two there's the engine cooling system that is separate has its own radiator and everything and uses the mechanical water pump from the engine and then the hybrid system and the turbo intercooler uses a combined unit which also has its own separate radiator and it has an electronic water pump that cycles the coolant in between, which is 
good. Speaking of the hybrid system, let us dive into it and we'll talk about it. Now, in the kind of the internal Toyota technician world, this is called the torque converter less hybrid system or transmission. So here's what they did. They scanned through the conventional hybrid system that they've had for a very long time. The problems with those systems were they were low on power, they were never really big on power, and then they had the drone from the transmission. And people kind of, as we go with time, people start to care more and more about driving aesthetics, so they came up with this system. So basically here, you have a standard six-speed transmission. Clutches, everything, it's a very normal transmission, except when it's not. Made it to this transmission, bolted to it permanently, is an electric motor, one electric motor only. And to made it to that electric motor is a clutch. And that clutch is engaged to that motor on one side, or the transmission as well, and the engine on the other side. So here's how this briefly works. You want to drive in EV mode, or the engine is off. The motor is gonna directly drive the transmission because it's connected to it. You apply power to it, it's gonna drive the car. If you want to start the engine, it's gonna engage the clutch, power the motor, the electric motor, and that's gonna turn the engine. And when you want to drive the engine driving the car, the engine will be running and has power. The clutch will be engaged, the motor will be idling or charging the battery, and then the engine will spin the transmission. If you want both of them to drive, you basically engage the clutch, have the engine drive the transmission, and then the electric motor in between them, apply power to it, it's gonna give it a boost. Pretty smart idea, and it's pretty simple, a lot more complicated in reality. But here's what they did with the Hybrid Max that is an additional boost. And we'll look at that more when we look underneath the car. The rear differential is completely different, or the rear transaxle is completely different than that of the regular hybrid, which by the way, if you have the hybrid trim, it has a, exactly the same as a, as a Highlander hybrid, exact same setup in the back. And if you have a non-hybrid, you'll have an exact same setup as a non-hybrid Highlander, just transfer case in the front, mechanical, differential in the back, coupler in the back, very simple. How does this system actually work in the real world? Here's my observations as driving this car for a week and then kind of with my mechanical experience. I think the best thing about this system is it solves many issues with the hybrid system. It is still efficient, not as efficient, but still efficient for a car of this size. And then it is smooth. It is very smooth. The operation of this is very smooth, with the exception of a couple things we're going to talk about in a bit. The other thing is it doesn't drone. It's pretty powerful. It almost makes up for the V6 being missing from the Highlander now for a year. The downside of this is occasionally there are certain driving conditions where you need the engine to come on and you're driving at higher speeds, it's gonna need to disengage the transmission, engage the clutch, start the engine, then engage again, and you might feel a slight delay. It's not very bad, but it is there, and truth have to be said. The other thing is, occasionally, this system will shudder at kind of a creep. Now, this particular one would not do that, and it might be something with the Grand Highlander, but for example, the Crown we looked at did have that, and that is, it could be annoying. This one is not doing it right now, so I hope they fixed it already. Now, a few things that changed about this hybrid system as far as the inverter and the orientation of things, let's kind of talk about the parts and nuts and bolts. Normally, in this area, you'll find the inverter in regular hybrids. That's how it is with the Grand Highlander hybrid. In this one, they kind of shuffled things around to make space because this transmission is actually massive. They moved the inverter on top of the transmission directly. And it's a much smaller inverter because it does not drive the rear one because the rear unit has its own inverter now. And they moved the DC to DC converter up top. DC to DC converter, just in case you're wondering, is basically the alternator, because this hybrid max system does not have an alternator, so that is your alternator. Now the hybrid battery in the Grand Highlander, both in the hybrid max and in the regular hybrid, sit underneath the back seat. Now, a few things we're gonna say about the battery, and we will move on, because this debate can go very long. The battery in this is nickel metal hydride. That is the one battery and the only battery available. There is actually two configurations of battery. The regular hybrid will have a slightly smaller, less capacity battery, lower voltage, and the hybrid max will have a little bit higher capacity battery with higher voltage. Why did they go nickel metal hydride? 
I actually applaud them for that because lithium-ion batteries, as good as everybody makes them out to be, they are not proven. You cannot find a lithium-ion battery hybrid car that is 20 years old. You can find a nickel metal hydride one that is 20 years old. So that is why they went with nickel metal hydride. And then the other thing is, this battery does have a filter. That you need to actually maintain and know where the openings are. So that is the one thing about this and the hybrid model that you need to know about as an owner. Another thing, and kind of we're going to dive into the mechanics eyes. What do I see here for the future, for reliability? The engine cover is actually a functional piece. It no longer is just sound insulation and make things look pretty. They kind of designed a air funnel, if you would, to kind of push some of that air out because now we have a heat generator additional one, the turbo. So if you look in the front, you have actually a channel that goes up then across the cover, and then you have a little flap that closes the area and pushes air away from the turbo underneath the car and out. Don't remove this engine cover. Some people have had the tendency of removing the engine cover because it's just a beauty cover. Here, it actually serves a function, and please don't remove it. Another observation here, things are pretty high quality, and I like it. I don't see a dip in quality. I think things, pretty much typical Toyota stuff, good quality plastics, good quality design. I do have one thing to say though. Even though this is a pretty large engine bay, I feel like you can easily fit a V6 here. The turbo being in the back is a slight concern because should you need to do anything to that turbo, access is a problem. And what makes that access worse is the engine sits so far back and you have this high nose of the car. This is something we saw with the current generation Highlander that also has the same thing. Access is very difficult in these. I mean, you really have to go over and in to get access. And with the four cylinder being so way, so back, that is a, another concern. But otherwise, let's say you are taller and you don't have the high challenges, uh, for example, I do. Access is good. There's plenty of room in the front, plenty of room in the side, plenty of room on that side, especially if you want to do a water pump, drive bell, whatnot, simple service. Things are Toyota as usual. They don't overcomplicate things. Things are pretty basic. This, unlike the A25, doesn't have a special cooling replacement procedure because it has a mechanical water pump. So there are some things that are better than the A25, but the one thing that is not these injectors, these direct injectors on the valve cover, I kind of wish they didn't do that. Let's take a look underneath the Toyota Grand Highlander. Starting with the front, everything's covered up. You do have a little opening here for the subframe. This is actually a lift point for the front. Now, Toyota always never really complicated their service and with the addition of the cover, some folks have voiced concerns, but this opening right here is for the oil filter and to drain the engine oil. Transmission would be here, so you'd have to remove this entire cover. Same thing with coolant, you'd have to remove the front cover right here, which is not really the end of the world. They're very simple covers to remove. But one thing on the transmission, and this is the interesting thing for me. So all three possible transmission options, the eight speed, the ECVT hybrid, and then this one, the PC60, the hybrid max transmission, they all use the same fluid. They all use Toyota WS fluid, which is pretty standard, simple, been around for a long time. And with that, before we go to the back, talk about the fluids for the back, let us talk about the front suspension and the brakes. So you have an aluminum knuckle, which everybody seems to be very excited about. It's actually not the greatest thing in the planet because this is a car we're hoping that would last a long time. And should you need to replace that bearing, it's gonna weld itself to that and we have issues. The front brakes are two piston caliper, very similar to the Highlander, pretty decent size for a car of this big, but these brakes are exactly the same as the Highlander. Lower control arm is steel control arm with a separate ball joint. This is a very typical Toyota design that they've used for a long time. And if we wrap around, this is a typical McPherson strut design in the front, very popular design with Toyota. They do have a steel sway bar link here. This is the good Toyota sway bar, not the aluminum one. The aluminum ones do have some issues. And then things are extremely simple here. Very basic suspension. Again, this is not a car meant for great handling. It is a family car after all. That was not the intent. Now, as we walk around back here, I've, we looked at the crown probably the week past. The exhaust felt a little on the cheaper side. Here, things get back. I like this exhaust. It just feels 
the typical solid exhaust with one exception. If we wrap around and look up here, we do have this flex pipe. They return to start using this. This is not the best idea in the plant. I wish they had that awesome flex joint with, with the flex gasket. That is a much better design than this. Things are pretty well covered here. I like that these covers extend. However, the edges are open. You can see the, the frame here, but everything looks nice and protected, if you would. I like, Toyota usually finishes their cars well underneath, and that's something that they've done for a long time. The exhaust kind of takes a little turn in this hybrid max, and then it goes back. But what is the same about the exhaust is these flanges, these to me, I've been working on Toyota for a very long time. These flanges are getting smaller and smaller, and that is the unfortunate thing about them. Now, as we look in the back, before we get to the suspension and brakes, look at this massive behemoth that I would have really loved if they would have put a cover here just to protect it. In the Crown they did, in some other models they did, in this one they did not, and you can see it. Folks, this is easily three times bigger than the standard all-wheel drive motor of the regular hybrid. This is a Hybrid Max one. This does a lot. This actually has a much bigger motor, it has a differential, and it has the inverter here as well. You even have coolant coming here. And the interesting thing about this one is, this takes a different fluid. So this does not use WS fluid for its service. It uses the new fluid that we have, the E transaxle fluid for like started with the BZ4X. And then this is actually the exact same rear unit from a BZ4X, very big unit, it's pretty massive. And it does a lot to this powertrain. So because this is a much bigger motor, it just, it has a lot more power and they really have the cleverness of switching which side you want the power going to. That is pretty cool. Now look at the rear suspension, pretty standard Highlander rear suspension, nothing really about it. Aluminum knuckle as well here, and it is becoming the norm. Single piston caliper with the integrated parking brake that is electronic, which I really like these. This is, people seem to not like it. This is one of the greatest inventions because if you ever worked on parking brake like the inside the rotor hat, you'll know why this is a better idea. Now the something interesting here, the uh, rear sway bar it, link is pretty interesting shape. It is uh, the, usually when, when you have sway bars that look like this, this is an afterthought because it's a very intricate shape. I mean, just look at this thing. I don't know why we had to make it this shape, but they did, that's okay. As we come to the back here, Everything is pretty standard. One muffler, two exhaust tips. This one actually has an actual tip. And if you notice here, they made an effort to cover this area to an extent. You do have an open void here, which is okay, but they did try to at least cover the edges. Now, don't mind the tape. This is a pre-production prototype. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but everything is nice and covered here. I like it. But then what I like more about that is when we come around and talk about the wheels, so Toyota lately has been switching away for reasons unknown to anybody. They're switching away from wheel studs to wheel bolts, but I'm happy to announce the Grand Highlander. These are wheel studs with nuts on them. So this is what you want in Toyota if you are watching, probably not, but please switch back to these because they are the greatest thing that you ever did. Let's take a look of the outside of the 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander. But before we start, small disclaimer. This is a pre-production prototype, so we will not be heavily focusing on fit finish quality of a final finish because this does not have the standards of the final production model. Having said that, let us look at the front. For lack of a better word, this looks exactly like a RAV4. It is the Grand RAV4 Highlander thing. Very conservative design. It does look, a, in some angles, it looks sharp, but it is not the point of this car. Looks are not, this is a very functional car. As we get inside it, you'll see more of that. But I honestly do like the look of this. RAV4 looks decent for what it is, and this is the same thing. But it's kind of a surprise that they would take heavily after the RAV4. I mean, look at this headlight design heavily inspired by the RAV4. And then this nose that overhangs, almost like there's a little shaded area here. This is exactly like the RAV4 one. And it kind of gives you this specific model, kind of gives you a cue of what the 
mid-year refresh or the new Highlander will look like. It'll probably look exactly like this, just without the third row seat deal in the back. So this is bigger inside, of course. It is wider, it is taller, it is longer than the regular Highlander, hence the name the Grand Highlander. I do like that they did not go too much on this. They kept things simple. We look at the panels here, just the hood kind of comes down and just comes down. And then there's not much going on. They didn't overstyle this. Some people have said that they overstyled it. I'm not one of those people. But more important things on the technical side, the radar sensor remains behind the emblem, which is a very good place for it. It is nice and high, not low on the ground, anything hits. It's pretty high and far away from the typical hit spots. Now this car does have the latest Toyota safety sense. So you still have the camera on the windshield, but it's a lot more high definition camera. Same thing with the radar sensor. Most of the updates that happen to the Toyota safety sense, the new one is by using a better camera, using a better sensor, but most of it is software and how things kind of react. It works a lot better in these newer cars that are coming up with the new system than the previous ones. Now, as we wrap around, things here are very basic. I have only one thing that was strange. This is black, and this is kind of becoming the fashion in the automotive industry. It's just everybody uses a black, the cladding around in the wheel arch. Then there is this very curious line that starts here. It's almost like invisible because it's the edge of the fender. And then it appears, and then it dips down. And then as you go away, it starts going up. Very interesting, this dip. I wish this line was just straight. Would have been perfectly fine. And body repair guys would have been very happy. But now we have this dip. Perhaps they dipped it down because of the mirror. But yeah, they dipped that. But otherwise, there's not much going on. This is a super focused SUV. And if you're getting into one of these, that should be the focus. Now, something very interesting. And this is second car we looked at the crown and now this normally this is not the luxury model this is the car for the masses if you want the version of this that is the luxury one that's the lexus tx but this one you can lock the doors from the front this is a smart key car but you can also do that from the rear that is very cool and i feel like they're adding they added this particular feature to this car because this is a family SUV. You have your kid in your hand and you're coming to open the door. You have to drag your kid to the front, put your hand here, open it, then open the door for them to get them in. While here, you just walk up to this door and it's done. I feel like that was the heading for this because typically this is reserved for more, you know, the Lexus side of things. I love the box shape. They did not attempt in any way, shape or form at making this swoopy, make this small, kind of like the RX. It's just a giant window because this helps with your visibility from the inside because this, even though it might appear to be a small car, it's actually a massive car and driving it, you will feel that. Now we wrap around the back to the Grand RAV4 once more. I mean, here it even looks more like a RAV4. I kind of wish they styled it a little bit like the Highlander so we can justify the Highlander part, but this looks exactly like a RAV4, just very, very large. Love this writing that they're starting to do this more and more. And this one actually is not chrome. It is the body color, which makes it more subtle. It looks very elegant and I really like that. Now, one thing about this design, if we look at it from the side, you notice this is almost a 90 degree drop. Yes, the windshield does curve a little bit, but it's not a huge curve. And the reason for that is you, you get more space inside because when you have a curve here, it kills some of the storage space. So this is the Hyperbacks model and you see it here. Kind of like that it's, they're getting it smaller and smaller, the badging. And then they have this symbol right next to it. I'm assuming that is going to be the symbol that is going to symbolize the Hyperbacks. Now, we've been seeing this in a lot of new cars. There's no bumper. So any hit, you're back into a little one of those little poles by the gas station. You're going to hit not only the bumper, you're going to hit the door and possibly damage it. Now it doesn't want to open. This is something I'm seeing in a lot of manufacturers. We've seen it in the Sienna. It's the same deal. But let's look at the back here. Is, uh, this is where the Grand Highlander part comes about. I mean, this third row is up and you have this much space. This is actually really good. And that's the whole point of this car. 
Normally cars that have a third row seat, when you put it up, I mean, you have this little space here, you have actually usable space. What I like more about it, there's no gimmicks about the third row seat. I have kids, potentially people that will buy a car like this also have kids and you need, you need the car not to get in your way of taking care of your kids. If I want to put the third row seat up here or put it down for something big, just push this, third row seat is out. And this is a huge space. It's flat floor. And this is where this becomes better than the Sequoia because it's a flat floor. And if you want to put them up, just as simple as that. I don't have to be pressing a button, waiting, or some magic operation to make them go up. Simple, simple is good in cars like this. Then we look here. You have some storage areas here. And then the Tanu cover is, it has a place to hide in case you don't want it to be out. And this is a very nice thing. Now you look at this, it's like, well, it's probably doesn't have a spare tire anymore. And you'll be wrong. This is one of the things I do not like about this. You have to kind of pop this entire panel and it, then you see the spare tire right underneath here. They could have done this better. He could have really done this better, and then this whole thing doesn't sit right. And you actually have to remove the tenu cover, remove the side cover. It just, they could have done this better, but hey, we're not going to complain. At least there is a spare tire, and that's the good part. Now, just like all the newer models, this does have two buttons. You do have one that closes the back and one that locks the door. And then the shocks that operate the door. This, is, this has become the standard for the automotive industry. Inside this shock, there's a motor. When this motor goes out, you unfortunately cannot easily operate the door. That's the only downside of these. But because there's two shocks, you have less chance of this door getting bent. In the past, we used to have a single hinge. Now we have two hinges. Basically, both of these are motors that open the door, which is a good thing. Well, let's talk about the interior of the 24 Toyota Grand Highlander. And one thing I have to be said before we start talking about the interior, this is a pre-production prototype, so we will not be commenting on some of the fit and finish, kind of the final materials, because they are not to the production standards. Now, something about the Grand Highlander, when you first step into this interior, it does not wow you, because everything looks very generic initially. But as you start using this car, what is going to wow you is how functional it is. I mean, I feel like it was intentional. They did not overstyle this interior. They did not go all out with everything. They focused more on functionality. And in that department, it is really good. The truth has to be said. Let's start with some key aspects here. You look at the HVAC controls. They are not overcomplicated. They're simply laid out very high, all physical button. It's very simple. Even the heated and cooled seats, physical button, no gimmicks, no thrills. Doesn't take you more than five minutes to be super familiar with all the functions. And that's exactly the point. And then you look in the center stack over here. You have a Prius style shifter in this Hybrid Max model, but it is a very familiar shifter. Not really something strange or extravagant just to, for the sake of being cool. It works today, it worked 10, 15 years ago with the Prius, and it'll work for another 10, 15 years without issues. But what makes this interior stand out is the little stuff. You have this huge storage area right here, a lot of these round things where you store round objects. But then the center console. I'm noticing more and more newer cars. You look at the center console, it's tiny. This thing has a massive center console. The entrance is small, and that's probably the only concern about it. But otherwise, it is very big and very functional. But more than that, you look in this area, in front of the passenger, there's another storage area. Usually cars will want to make this swoop design so it look cool. They put a storage area there with a USB-C right next to it, thinking of the passenger. More on this interior, the steering wheel controls are very typical Toyota. It takes you nothing more than a minute or two to get familiar with it. No gimmicks, no touch, this and that. They're all physical buttons, very simple to operate. Then we look at the gauge. This is the newest gauge that Toyota has. 
it is all screen. I typically don't like them because I feel like they add nothing but look cool. But this one, at least they integrated the map in the middle. It does take you a little bit more time to figure this one out. It basically has three configurations. You can save the settings. You can switch quickly between them. They added a lot of configurability here, which is nice. Typically, Toyota doesn't do stuff like that. They don't deem this necessary, but they did good work with this. It's not perfect, but hey, if we're going to have a full screen, at least it does something more than basically have gauges that mimicked in the screen. Now, the seat is very comfortable, but one thing has to be said, and this is something it is immediately apparent. It is a little bit on the narrow side. If you compare it to something like a Sequoia, Sequoia has a huge seat. This doesn't have a huge seat for something this big. This is, this is a pretty big SUV. Now, the only thing that kind of feels out of place here is this very large rotary dial knob with a lot of buttons around it for the drive mode. I feel like this shouldn't be here could have been in the screen or something because it takes a lot of real estate here just for you to rock and dirt mud and sand it just yeah this feels completely out of place but moving on from that to the infotainment system typically we glance over infotainment systems and newer toyotas in this one we're going to give you a little bit more details technical details not really how functions and features and whatnot this is called the 21 cy that's the designation for it internally. So basically, this is a 2021 calendar year infotainment system. That's how Toyota classifies their infotainment systems. By the way, you think, wait a second, 24 car, the 21 infotainment system? That's how all auto manufacturers work. They will design one infotainment system and they'll keep going with it until they do another refresh or change. This system uh, fixed a lot of the issues that people always complain about with Toyota infotainment. Better touchscreen and a little bit more customizations. And the biggest thing is wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But that came at a cost. And let's talk about the bad things about this infotainment system. Very glitchy, and that have to be said compared to the previous ones with the wired connection. Very glitchy, occasionally won't connect, and you kind of have to restart the car for it to connect. That's one of its things. The second thing is the initial setup with the whole profile and going back and forth can be a little bit cumbersome. They could have made it a little bit easier, but once you set it up, it's fine and we're done. It's kind of a one-time deal. Now, this system has over-the-air update because it is Wi-Fi enabled and it does have internet if you want subscription, but these updates, they don't come as frequent as you like. And this is historically the case, not just with Toyota, with everybody. The problem is you're trying to keep this infotainment system current with the phone updates i mean phone updates come every few weeks the car manufacturers don't come every few weeks and occasionally when the phone software gets updated the infotainment system no longer is compatible because of a software issue and then you have all kinds of problems until they catch up with their software update these are the problems with these modern infotainment systems and this one is no exception they did do the over the air update at least so you don't have to go to the dealership to get these updates but still, they still don't come fast enough, and that is kind of a universal problem. This is not just Toyota. Now, there are a few interesting things to me here. Let's talk about them briefly. First thing is, this is the second car from Toyota that has gold accents on the inside. The Crown had it, and now the Grand Highlander has it. This, uh, in case you are familiar with the real estate world, gold is a color that is making a comeback. We'll come back to the 90s. So... They have gold accents, and that's probably the only design cue in this car. Everything else is heavily focused on function and not really looks or gimmicks. The second thing is this has Toyota Safety Sense 3.0. And while it is pretty good for safety, there is a mode that you can put this car in where as you approach a car in front of you, let go of the gas, it'll actually start braking for you. And that mode can be extremely annoying at highway speeds. Basically, it'll be slamming the brakes every time you let go of the gas because you're approaching another car. You can turn it off from the screen. I just wish some of these systems have physical buttons because you're driving and you're trying to turn off some of these annoying systems in certain driving conditions. You have to go through the screen, and this is the part where the screen and the gauge does take a minute or two for you to get used to how it works. So that's the only downside of that. Speaking of the brakes, there is a very interesting feature here, which I can see one scenario where it actually makes sense, but it's kind of an interesting gimmick. So you, there's an option in the infotainment screen to 
notify you when the brake lights are on and it shows you two red lines at the bottom of the screen in the gauge i don't know why that was a feature but i suppose the only condition where you want that to happen is when you're kind of driving with some of the self-driving features or the adaptive cruise control and you want to know when the car is actually applying the brakes with the lights on you can see them on the gauge that's possibly the only scenario but it was kind of interesting there's even an option to turn it on or off on the screen let's talk about second row seat in the grand highlander i am 5'7 this is my driving position i have plenty of knee room here things are very comfortable this is a very comfortable seat equally to the front one though it is on the narrow side that's the only thing about it now some of the things here because this is a very focused car you do have climate controls here the only concern about it is you do not have a physical button to disable these rear climate controls in the front so here's a typical scenario your kids are sitting here and they are changing the the temperature up down up down turning on the heat you just want to lock it out you don't have a physical button in the front to do that that is possibly an oversight would have been really nice now something interesting these are captain chairs and in the middle you have some storage here but the coolest thing about that is you can actually remove this storage unit and the reason for that is if you have only two kids here you want them to have some some space for their items but if you have kids in the back you don't want to fold the seats and have them go back you can just have them go in, in between the rows but this is now in the way well you can remove it this is a very smart idea you can have an option of both do you want storage space for for items or do you want to pass through this is a very good idea and because this is a large suv do you have ac vents or hvac vents on the roof normally you'll see them on the pillar because the pillar is easier to do manufacturing wise this has it on the headliner which is the way to go and what i love about it is you still have a lot of headroom you have this giant panel sunroof here and the vents on the roof and you still have a lot of headroom and that is a good design let's talk about the third row seat in the grand highlander which i believe is the most important part i mean this is the biggest difference between this and a standard highlander i'm five seven this is my second row seating position which is i can probably push it a little bit forward but i intentionally put it back in front of it is my driving position i have some knee room and that's the biggest thing about this i'm actually comfortable here and getting in and out is not bad in this car and that's where they really did this well now the only thing is of course it's a third row seat my inner thigh is way far from the seat so i'm like hunched up a little bit but that's that's how all third row seats are unless you get in something like a minivan now the space here you can technically sit three people however if you pull full-size adults they're probably be comfortable two of them here but if you have skinnier adults or children you can easily sit three of them here safely and their heads are not right against the glass there's some real estate because as parents we sometimes get nervous when we put our kids in a third three row suv that the glass is right here and you feel like okay in case of an accident they're right there here there is more real estate behind you which is nice now some of the interesting things and this is what i love about this interior being focused about family function not really gimmicks and everything else you have some storage here but more importantly you have an ac vent on the roof on both sides that is a good thing you do have some usb-c connectors right here and this is a comfortable space i mean as an adult i can sit here maybe not an eight ten hour trip but you can sit here comfortably you can sit actual adults here that is pretty impressive let's talk about some things i do not like about the toyota grand highlander and one thing have to be said here and it's the truth there's very little not to like about a car like this it is laser focused it is functional it is sensible it is not a fun car doesn't handle well it feels like a giant boat but you know what that is the intended purpose they didn't set out to say this was luxurious or excellent handling no this is a great family SUV with a big third row and then some space behind it. That's exactly what it is. This car does not give you a hard time to operate it. But here's the problem with that. Isn't the Sienna exactly that? Because if you compare this to a Toyota Sienna, 
The Sienna is the ultimate family hauler. It is bigger, it is more comfortable, it has a lot more features that are family focused. And the worst part about it is, at the base price level, this costs more than the Sienna. That is a problem. Because if you're after that sensible, functional family hauler, the Sienna wins that every day. And now that it costs less, that becomes a bigger problem. The only thing that takes this over the Sienna is a hybrid max system because the Sienna struggles when you fully load it, put passengers, and as a sensible family person, that might be an issue. If you take it on regular trips in mountains and whatnot, you're going to feel like you're always pushing this car. It's underpowered. This, with the hybrid max system, feels a lot better. But then we go back to the same thing. It all comes to that sensible person. They will take one good look at this and its price and its functionality and the Sienna. And the Sienna is a true winner here, except the hybrid max system. So should you buy a 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander? Folks, this is back to basics. It is a very sensible, focused car. I love that about it, and that's probably the best thing about it. It does not have wow factor and gimmicks and nothing. It is focused on being a good family SUV. It is focused on a sensible family that needs an SUV with a proper third row seat and then some space behind that third row seat for travel, for to haul the family and whatnot, and this does that very well. This car, when you open the door and step in it, or you even look at outside, doesn't have a wow factor. The words are, it feels like a kitchen appliance. But you know what? We all need kitchen appliances. We depend on them daily without knowing it and without really putting too much thought into it. But not everybody needs something very, very exciting in an SUV, like say, I don't know, a Porsche 911 GT3. Not all of us need that. Some of us have kids in real life and we don't need the car to get in the way. And this is exactly what this is. The only problem with this car is a Toyota Sienna. As we talked about, this gets into that territory. But where this comes back, if you really do not want a minivan for whatever reason, this is actually a pretty good alternative and it does make sense in that aspect. The only thing where this goes above the Toyota Sienna minivan is the Hybrid Max system. This more than makes up for the V6 that is now missing from the Highlander altogether. It has decent power, and this is one complaint about the Sienna Hybrid. Loaded with passengers and luggage, the Sienna Hybrid does struggle because it doesn't make a lot of power. But here you have the Hybrid Max. If Toyota were to introduce their awesome Hybrid Max system in the Sienna, then this would start to fade because at that point, you're probably better off getting a Sienna. That is the God honest truth, folks. This, in my opinion, and many apparently do not share that opinion, is a breath of fresh air because this car does not have gimmicks, does not have things that are just there just to impress you and wow you. The only thing that will impress you about this car is its functionality and its sensible approach. There is no gimmicks, there is no extra stuff, there is everything that you need as a family person that needs a proper third row and then some. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.